So last, last one of the day. Um, so you made a big career shift in the last couple <laughs> years. You went from uh, running a payments company that you sold to, to PayPal, you know, and then you shifted gears completely and went into neuroscience and neurotechnology. And um, your new company, which you invested $100 million into, or into that plus an OS fund last year, um, you describe it as a way to read and write neural code, right? right? So what do you mean by that? Yeah, maybe the best way to explain this is the comparison to genetics, yeah. where we have gotten the cost of sequencing a genome to a reasonable cost, roughly $1,000, and we now have tools to edit the genome. Yeah. So we have this biological system, and we can now sequence it, we can read the genome, and we can now write to it. And so yeah. over the past couple of years, there's been 2,400 trials spin up in gene editing, uh, in humans and plants and all kinds of things. So there's been this explosion of question of, for example, what can you do in fertility or yeah. solving disease in humans or actually improving humans. And so it's a, the, the tool set has enabled this expansion of imagination of if we could actually read and write our genetic code, what could we do? And so the same thing is true for the brain. If we could create tools to read and write our neural code, and actually intervene in our cognitive evolution. So we're now playing with disease, dysfunction, imagination, creativity, attention, focus, mm -hmm. communication. What kind of questions could we pose? So what, was there a particular moment for you, like a paper that you read, a researcher that you talked to that kind of crystallized this idea that um, you know, BCI or brain-computer interfaces were you know, on the verge of um, commercialization or possible commercialization? No, it wasn't that I saw it from an opportunity of like, it's the right time to do this. Yeah. Uh, from a commercial perspective, my observation was when I look at the world and I contemplate, for example, 2050, and I wonder, and I'm going to make some assumptions. I'm going to assume that we all enjoy being here today, that being present in this conversation is fun, being at this conference is a good time, mm. and that if one of us got diagnosed with a terminal illness, that would be undesirable. If the world fell apart, we are in an anarchic state, that would be mm. undesirable. So assuming that we want some type of pleasant future in 2050 mm. where we can play our games and develop technology and have these conversations, then the thing that occurred to me is the single highest value thing I could work on would be to, re to build the tools to read and write our neural code so that humans can self-direct their cognitive evolution. Mm -hmm. and in other words, I view that the future is much different than the past and the future is going to be very complex for two reasons. One is the pace of change is increasing, uh, which means that we as a society, our institutions can handle a certain amount of change over a certain period of time. And the, the quickness of change puts pressure on that system. And we can only withstand so much before they collapse. Same with us individually. Yeah. And so the future presents this complexity where will we be able to withstand the, the quickness of change? And then secondly, is we have a emergent complexity in society. And so my singular question is, can we get to 2050 and survive, be happy, and be relevant? Mm -hmm. And to me, the singular thing we should focus on, as a, and not, I mean, we need to focus on a ton of things, but the thing that deserves the most attention is our brain, because everything we are, everything we're all building, everything we aspire to become is a product of our brain. Mm -hmm. And I observed the world, and it was like this blind spot. I, th I looked at like, what entrepreneurs are working on this, what are investors funding, what's the government funding, and I saw an absence of velocity and capital to achieve the goals and the time skills I thought were relevant. So I feel like we are at risk and we're behind in the game of where we need to be technically with ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about the learning curve of shifting from finance to neuroscience? I mean, what since making this big kind of pub public commitment uh, around a year ago, what kind of hypotheses have you proven or disproven in this field? Yeah, we haven't talked about anything publicly. We've been very quiet. Yeah. Um, so can you talk about, like, what, what are the um, biggest obstacles that you see today in terms of getting brain science forward? Yeah, if building Kernel is not the hardest company in the world to build, yeah. it's probably pretty close yeah. uh, because we know very little about the brain and everything around the brain is very complex. Uh, but I will say that it's the most invigorating experience of my life mm -hmm. uh, because it's incredibly challenging, which I love. But it's also a difficult game. For example, if you look at the toolkits we have in neuroscience today, for example, like deep brain stimulators, there's 150,000 people who have brain implants today to treat Parkinson's disease, uh, central tremor. Uh, that takes roughly 10 to 15 years and $300 million to get to market. That's a single iteration of a product. Mm -hmm. And so the iteration cycles are slow. You have like four 
uh, existential risks you have to compound. So it's incredibly hard for a startup to make the distance. And so it's just not conducive for rapid iteration or an easy entry point. So it's very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. Is the vision of, of Kernel to treat um, conditions or medical conditions initially with like a very specific, you know, either device or treatment, or is it to expand, um, you know, just or augment uh, normal human capabilities or, or cognitive capabilities? We'd like, to, I would like to build tools for the brain that do the equivalent of what we have in genetics. I'd mm -hmm. like to build a toolkit that enables us to ask any question. For example, like could you and I do brain to brain communication? Yeah. Could you and I feel like we're one person? Could I expand my imagination by a hundredfold? Could I invent things that have never been done before because I have this new way of processing information? Could I have a perfect memory? Could I delete mm -hmm. memories? Could I, and a thousand other questions. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, I mean, one point of argument that you've made is that the current debate over artificial intelligence is, as an existential threat, is actually misguided and that um, we're allocating our financial resources and attention on, on this uh, inappropriately and away from um, human intelligence or human resilience. And can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I think it's misprioritized. And specifically what I think is if the conversation around AI is people are saying, hey, there's this thing that is potentially a big threat to us because it may take us over and or run away and otherwise prevent us from living the lives that we have contemplated for ourselves. And my observation is it is certainly true that artificial intelligence is a potential threat. And we should not minimize that whatsoever. It has a range of possible outcomes. But if we look at the history of the human race and how, how good we've been at predicting the future development of technology, we get an F. We get a failing grade. And if you look, for example, of the beginning of the printing press, of the internet, of computers, of every major technology, you ask humans during that time and age, what will it be used for? We almost never got it right. And so I'm not saying the current approximations are not correct. What I'm saying is we need to bear in mind we have been awful at predicting the past. With that said, I think the one thing that is, is clear is that humans do pose a threat to society. And like, what's the evidence? Like exhibit A, all of human history. And so if we contemplate this question of like what things threaten us the most, and I can come back to the brain. It's, it's the human brain which is causing the threats that we share among each other. It is the human brain building AI. And so to me, it goes as, as a stack order. What things can we prioritize in our conversations, in our investment, in our exploration, to then have the greatest impact everywhere else? Because whether you're building in synthetic biology, or government, or your personal relationship, it's a product of your cognition. Mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, do you, I'm curious, do you have a sense of the ratio of like how much you know, the private sector is investing in AI and machine learning relative to the field that you're in? Do you, yeah. do you, is it like an order of magnitude? Yeah, so there's some data we, we captured internally, and these are approximations yeah. because the definitions aren't clear, but we spent roughly $21 billion, last, $21 billion last year in AI and roughly $21 billion in cosmetic surgery. And so the difference between those two investments is the investment in AI produces a compounded return. Right. And the investment in cosmetic surgery is a depreciating asset. And so what if we could make that 21 billion for our own cognition a compounded return? Mm -hmm. And you also said part of the reason that you made the commitment last year was because, I mean, there was a, you know, effectively a blind stop, a spot mm -hmm. in um, the private financing world where venture firms weren't making the commitment in this because yeah. the time horizons were too long mm -hmm. or they didn't have the familiarity with the space. Um, so, I mean, what, I mean, what do you see your role in this relative to, say, you know, traditional sources of funding for research and university research, like where, where does your, where's your piece in this jigsaw puzzle? Yeah, in society, we have social proof. And so for example, I live on the tail end of social proof of listening to uh, artists. I go to Spotify or Pandora and listen to the artists that are presented to me usually. I don't find these artists in the dive bars. And so most of us in society live on the tail end of like what we're told by others is important, we should pursue, we should care about. And when I started Kernel or started thinking about this, there, is a t there was a total lack of social proof that evolving our cognition mm -hmm. is something we should care about or talk about or invest in or explore. And so for example, even when I go to an investor today, like 99% of investors when I talk about neuroscience or why this would be relevant, they have no idea how to think about it. They have no idea that they should care about it. They don't know what's, it, it should be cool. They just don't know. And so we lack a, an awareness as a society that working on the brain may yield uh, gains in everything we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. 
Are there any kind of ethical considerations or like design issues that you run into that are completely unique to BCI that you just wouldn't find in other forms of human computer interaction? And if so, what are those? Yeah, I mean, if we're successful in building these tools to evolve our cognitive evolution, it's the biggest revolution in the history of the human race because we're basically evolving as a species. And so the questions that emerge in ethics and morals are limitless. And this is one of the first conversations, the, one of the first things that comes up whenever we talk about this is people will say, well, what are you going to do if people, are people going to misuse this? Are they going to do harm? Well, yes, they are. Like, yeah. people always misuse technology. And so the fact that Facebook is weaponized, like, why are we surprised that's the case? And so the question I think that's more relevant for us to ask is, is working on our cognitive evolution a question of luxury or is it one of necessity? Mm -hmm. And so the necessity argument I make is I say the future is, is different than the past and that the pressures and the complexity coming our way, we may get overwhelmed and be insufficiently adaptable to, a co to survive in the future. Therefore, I make the necessity argument. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people make the luxury argument that things are overblown, it's not necessary for us to get upset about these things, we'll just figure things out, and that doing this we want to, you know, quote unquote, remain human. And so the question becomes, what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. And I think the, the other way to frame that is, like, what are we also scared about losing? Like, what, what is it that we're trying to prevent? When you, when you use this language, I mean, we say the phrasing cognitive evolution, I mean, you know, as a CEO or as a founder in the space, um, you know, what parts of cognitive evolution would you prioritize first if you're talking about augmenting, you know, yeah. basic human cognitive capabilities? So my daughter's on a soccer team and I coach her team. And if you watch little kids play soccer, if the ball is traveling, let's say this way, the child will, will run at the ball at a misguided angle and then catch up with the ball. So instead of anticipating how to intercept the ball, it's something they have cognitively have not learned yet. And so they can't properly anticipate interception angles. Mm -hmm. And through my, I guess, the past decade of studying the brain myself, I became convinced that I personally am very cognitively impaired. Mm -hmm. So if I look, for example, at my cognitive biases, my blind spots, my overconfidence, I realize that I, I think I see the world very clearly, but I actually don't. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest thing is we're trapped in our box and we don't realize we're trapped in our box. And so when I try to superimpose my imagination on the possibilities, my first principles approach is to say, I really don't know because I'm constrained in my imagination by what I'm familiar with. Therefore, what I'd like to do is build the tools mm -hmm. where we can simply ask questions. And that's my role is building the tools to allow us to ask questions to acknowledge that I am indeed trapped in my box and I can't see outside of it. Mm -hmm. And you've also said the field has a tools or tools design problem. Um, can, you, can you elaborate on a little bit what that means? Yeah, if the analogy is genetics, like we have this great toolkit to now explore everything in genetics, what do we have in neuroscience? We have MRI to scan the brain, we have deep brain stimulators for implantation, for essential tremor, we have uh, ultrasound ablation, etc. And we say, are these tools sufficiently powerful for us to evolve our cognition at a pace and on a scale that's relevant? Mm -hmm. And so again, it comes back to this intersecting argument of, is this a necessity? Is this a luxury? What kind of tools we need on what time scales? Who's going to develop them? How much are they going to cost? So it's a really complicated web of, of conversations, of topics. Mm -hmm. um, can you also talk a little bit about some of the like, you know, researchers that you've you've worked with in the company? Like, I know that initially, when you started Kernel, you started with a University of Southern California professor, and then you shifted through an acquisition back in February of a couple of MIT-based um, scientists. Like, what what was that process like for figuring out which which research area to work in and which researchers to work with? Yeah, neuroscience is like a game of Jenga. If you've played that game where it's a stack of wood blocks yeah. and you poke up the little pieces to find what's loose, neuroscience is that game. And it's not the case there's just simply low-hanging fruits everywhere. And it's like, I'll snag. This one is my best opportunity. It's extra extraordinarily complex. And there are no easy entry points. There's no easy conclusions and everybody's trying to find entry points to make something commercially viable because yeah. it's just really, really hard. Yeah. Um, what is the biggest you know, surprising learning that you've made in the last year from shifting from FinTech to this as, it, a, as, a, as a founder? Yeah. One, it's I've never been happier. Yeah. I love building a kernel. It makes me incredibly happy because it is extraordinarily hard. Uh, 
Two, I would say the most challenging thing has been the socialization of these ideas. Mm -hmm. It is incredibly hard for people to understand them, I truly understand them, um, and explore them mentally. We're just trapped. And so I guess I had a dinner last night with 12 people I hosted on this topic, and it's really hard. And so I, I created this scenario. I said, let's imagine we're in 2050, and we look back on 2017, and we are assessing our judgment. Like, did we identify and did we debate the right things? Or were we like so consumed with Trump, like we just missed it. Like we, were, we didn't see the thing that was like most important to talk about. And so I was trying to get people to say, what is the appropriate thing to identify? Mm -hmm. And I think it's just very hard for us to do it. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, the topic of this panel is about like hybrid humans. And then we were talking backstage and you said, um, that the bias or framing that people most often approach this question with is this bias of, of loss aversion. Like, yeah. what are we losing in our humanity or what are we losing as humans if we, you know, change our, you know, cognitive experience or yeah. neurological experience of this world in a different way? Um, and how do, you, how do you challenge their assumptions about this? How do you challenge your own assumptions about yeah, this? Yeah, I mean, it's what my mom said to me. Uh, you know, mom, what can I be in life? Well, anything you want, Brian. And I think yeah. that's what it means to be human, is anything we want. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, um, I mean, you've, you've alluded to some kind of broad visions in this interview, but like, you know, if we're making that, that, that visioning experiment for, two, you know, 20 years from now or 50, 40 years from now, how do you, what, 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 what I mean, what, what, like, when you when you think about human hybridism with this like with with this new BCI technology, like what kinds of how do you think we'll be interacting with the world? Yeah, a lot of people again create these really concrete visions of the future, like things are going to develop like this on this time scale and be like that. Yeah. And I again from a first principles perspective, I don't think we can predict the future. Yeah. I really don't. And I think that the most important thing is that we acknowledge that, that yeah. we have this cognitive limitation in doing that and that the most important thing is we become incredibly adaptable yeah. in responding to things in real time and that we then expand our cognitive abilities. Mm -hmm. Because for example, like when we talk about climate science, we assume human behavior is fixed. We assume human psychology is fixed. What if they weren't fixed? Could we think about it differently? And so again, like if, once you start evolving our cognition, everything in existence changes mm -hmm. because we can now play with the tool creator itself. The, t the brain is the master of all tools. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.